In our fast evolving world, things change at the speed of light. And if we truly want to create a successful company, it's important that we understand what are the factors that are going to determine our success. And our next guest is an expert on that. She is uh, pretty amazing. She's a powerhouse on her own. And she created a concept called Inspire Companies. So please welcome to the stage, Lisa McCallum. <laughs> welcome, Lisa. Hi, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Well, I'm so happy to, to have you here at the forum this year. And I know uh, last year you, you also participated, so, so it's, it's, it's great to see you. Thank you. So the first thing that I wanted to ask you, you created a concept um, that right now we have a new CEO. So who is calling the shots? Well, I think Gunhild opened so beautifully yesterday and not only hinted towards this, but I think went directly to it. This notion that ordinary people can change things. Mm -hmm. And to quote from her, she said, companies don't change, people change companies. Mm -hmm. And so drafting off of that concept, we created a concept called Inspired Companies and we and at the root of it is this notion that the new CEOs are ordinary people that are now empowered by the di digital revolution and the social media revolution. These folks have more power than ever to make or break companies faster than ever. So it's consumers, employees, and outsiders, those that buy from us in any form, those that work for us in any capacity, and the outsiders are those that in business we like to keep at a comfortable distance, right? So government, civil society, uh, regulators, uh, media and investors. Um, these are the folks now that have so much power uh, and ability to influence mainstream business and mainstream decisions, and the issue is that after a long era of profit at all costs and profit maximisation in the corporate sector, these ordinary people don't trust uh, mm -hmm. business. But what's so exciting today, and the reason that we're sort of really talking about this notion of inspired companies, is that ordinary people can change it. And the second part that's equally ex as exciting for us is that we're seeing some companies that are really embracing mm -hmm. this change versus resisting it, and they're the companies that are the more inspired ones. So what do you think that has influenced this change? Well, it uh, certainly is the collision of this digital revolution yes. and um, trust crisis coming together that has put power in the hands unprecedented, in an unprecedented way of people that don't trust business. But perhaps I can let, really bring it to life with an example. Um, because a lot of companies today are paralysed, actually. They don't know what to do because the rules of the old system that we're still in, frankly, so short-termism, mm -hmm. the requirement to keep your job in business, that we have to deliver profits in perpetuity, mm -hmm. that is in direct conflict with what the new CEOs want, okay? And there are no rules or norms or frameworks or strategies to help business know what to do because <laughs> the new CEOs are setting the new rules <laughs> and the markets haven't adjusted. And, and uh, I'll give you an example of how, you know, how overwhelming this feeling is today for business leaders. So, again, uh, Gunhild mentioned how overnight, as a Greta here in Sweden, changed things in the education sector in many ways, caused an uprising mm -hmm. and was able to um, mobilise people. So, in a similar way, there was a young schoolgirl in Canberra, Australia, and she was upset about what she was seeing on the back of her cereal box in the morning. She was upset because there wasn't enough diversity. Right? So she wrote a letter to Kellogg's and she said, uh, Dear Kellogg's, <laughs> I'm upset, I'm very unhappy because I'm sitting here having breakfast this morning with my Nutri-Grain box and I only see pictures of boys doing something awesome. <laughs> girls can do something <laughs> awesome too. For sure. Why can't girls be on the back? <laughs> Please fix this. And you know, and then in, in the in the way that a darling seven-year-old expresses yes. that, it's so simple. And when <laughs> Kellogg's did not come back with the right response as the first response. Her family, the community, her school, media then took it on and Kellogg suddenly finds themselves in a media storm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the great news here is that actually it was three weeks ago, Kellogg's came back and handled this in the end beautifully with their yeah. second response. But companies today do not get credit for changing their mind. Mm -hmm. You have to wire your company to make the right decision 
the first time. And this is tough for companies because there's not a lot of answers and norms and systems and strategies within and practices within companies to be able to do that. So, Lisa, you say that um, we, it's important to know in any company what the CEO wants, of course, for any workers. So what should we do? I mean, what are the new CEOs looking for in a company? We spent five years trying to answer this question. Um, so um, actually, and, and we, it was, it's all now published <laughs> here. This is um, a labor of love of about five years. Um, mm -hmm. I got together with another former Nike executive, Emily Brew, and we, after leaving Nike, and collectively we were there for about 30 years, we spent time looking at hundreds of examples across the world, across industries, to really understand and look for what are the new CEOs mm -hmm. asking for and which companies are succeeding. And we also paid equal attention to the companies that are failing. And after looking at enough examples, um, a framework and a set of building blocks and strategies actually started to present itself. And that's what we've published in now uh, this book called Inspired Inc. And if I can cut to the chase on the two big takeaways from all that work, uh, there's really two things. Uh, you have to do the work. There's no silver bullet. Uh -huh. um, there is a journey for each company to go on. And, uh, you know, it, it can take time depending on whether you're a big company or a small company, and, and it's going to be very different for each. And I think a concept that, uh, that you explain very well, uh, that is so fascinating, is that right now the consumers are not just satisfied with a product or with a service. They are looking for a purpose, for something um, that is uh, inspiring behind the company. How is all this playing in putting sustainability at the center stage? Mm. Well, so um, I think... 20 years ago, companies were able to potentially compete on the shelf because they had a good corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. program. And the consumers might have had some information that this company was a little better than that company. And today, uh, what we know is these consumers want significantly more than that. And for you to be able to earn their share of wallet, you need to be able to show up with significantly more believability, authenticity, and you need to be um, pursuing much bigger ideas. So after doing this work, we found that the companies that are succeeding and gaining the ultimate advocacy, trust, believability, and um, ultimate wallets of uh, consumers, the companies that are doing this well, they all start with one thing. And they start with an inspired mission. Some people talk about purpose statements. Yes. Um, we believe firmly that every company need, needs one statement to present what their big idea is to the world and present it in a way that has many winners. And companies that at the start line definition of their organization define an idea that invites these new CEOs in to participate in their company, in the idea that the company is pursuing, they're the ones that win. And to just, I'll just bring that to life really quickly. So um, some of the best ones that we've seen are and I'll just say the words here, I don't want to have judgment on the brands themselves. So, to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. To inspire and innovate for every athlete in the world, and if you have a body, you're an athlete. <laughs> yes. To make a better everyday life for the many people. Mm -hmm. To deliver a 100% slave-free chocolate industry. So these are the purpose statements for, you know, I'm not going to say it in order, Tesla, Nike, Ikea, and Tony Chocolonely. So. And um, these are the types of statements that from the beginning can invite ordinary people in to share those ideas. But big words in the corporate sector, we know, <laughs> don't mean much. It all comes down to action. And again, this is what we focused our entire effort yeah. on. In fact, I think I mentioned 85% of this book <laughs> is all about how to um, bring that authenticity to life and build some new frameworks and structures. And Because the corporate sector works off of norms in the same way that other organizations yeah. do. We've got to create new frameworks and work in unison yeah. um, and deliver them. I can't wait to read that book. <laughs> you promised to give it to me, so, uh, so yeah, I'm excited. That yeah, will be uh, my read uh, on the plane. So um, something that we were talking about just uh, backstage was that it was very important to be inclusive, to have a, a mission statement that was inclusive, that, um, that make it maybe resonates with, uh, with the new CEOs, with the consumers. Basically, why do I care why this is important to me. How do the, so how, 
how are the companies doing um, at translating the science-based uh, targets into, into something that is importable and resonates with, with the people? I think this was actually broached a little bit with the panel before us. So anyone who's been in brand marketing or communications before knows that you cannot make people care about your issue and care about what you care about. You can influence some of them if you do a really good job. Mm -hmm. What you can do, and if we want to have companies really take the science that we know works, and the people in this room know what the science is, you've got the answers, we actually have to do a far better job at translating that for the corporate sector to be able to run with. I think, you know, the default position has been for us to you know, outside the corporate sector, and I've lived in both worlds, so I can say us, mm -hmm. uh, is to, to come up with the answers, to work through all these complicated issues, to understand them at a true level of depth, and to then lob it over the fence mm -hmm. to the corporate sector to just sort of figure it out with this expectation that we're going to understand it and be able to run with it. And I mm -hmm. think that with all the will in the world, it's not going to happen unless we really look at the gap of translation and start to more specifically figure out how to take the gloves off on all sides of the sectors, roll sleeves up, get in there and get behind the companies that you actually believe have the will and the potential ability to do this and help with the translation and then publish it for all the sector to see. But it's that gap of, you know, the answers are there. It almost feels like we've got so many answers, we don't know what to do with it. And then you've got the corporate sector who, because we have to drive a profitable, a sustainable organisation, we're not funded by tax dollars, we have to move quickly in order to win the hearts, minds and advocacy of, of, of people to buy our products and services so that we can be in existence. We need help with the trans the translation of it. Totally. So uh, I was reading an article that you read, uh, that you wrote last year, and then you were saying that not only the consumers is important, but also the people that work for us. I mean, they need to be happy with with the job that they are doing and and the the mission of the company. So uh, with the power of social media at our phones and our hands, how do companies survive with unpopular opinions from workers or from <laughs> consumers? What should they do? Well, uh, I think if anyone's um, seen the New York Times even this week, um, we're living in a world right now that just feels like it's dominated by Amazon, Google and Facebook and all of the issues that they're, um, you know, in many ways rightly needing to focus on. Um, it can sometimes feel like, oh, there's such big companies, how is change going to be driven? But in the New York Times it was um, published this week and reported that 4,000, I think it was over 4,000 Amazon employees uprose within the company to say, cut ties with big oil and reduce our carbon footprint. And unless you're an employer sitting there that you've got the luxury of firing 4,000 people that you know, are driving change that you yeah. don't want to deal with, yes. you've got to make the change. It's not an option anymore. And the good news here is with, with all this power in the hands of especially yeah. employees, and I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, and that's why it's so exciting. What they're asking for fundamentally with this newfound voice is make the world a better place, please. And then businesses today are not really in a situation where they have an option <laughs> because they don't hold as much power as the outside yeah. world does today. Yeah. And, and you know what? I find that so inspiring to see that uh, times are changing and I think uh, our humanity uh, is evolving and um, people are more conscious and they are demanding change. Oh, there's no question. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, in fact, I think one of the biggest questions was, um, you know, Lisa, is the future here? Well, or is this the future? Well, the future is right here. Yes. And I think what is um, incredibly exciting, and it, I think a few years ago, um, it might have sounded like an oxymoron, but business with the world on side is more possible than ever. In fact, yeah. I'd argue that it is more important than ever and we have to get behind the companies that we believe in if we want to drive change. You can't just sit on the fence and not have a position. Get in there, figure out which companies, which leaders you believe in and help them succeed. Lisa, and if we are the, the CEOs of a company or a non-profit organization or a venture, what would be your, your five takeaways to create a company that is successful and then everybody wants to support? 
Oh, I'm glad you asked for five, because there happens to be five building blocks. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> that was actually not scripted at all. <laughs> That's great. And we kept it to five for that reason. So, there, you know, each company is going to be on a journey. And what we know is that any company who wants to get the new CEOs on side, create competitive advantage as a result, and ultimately sustain as an organisation, have to, A share a common set of values. They have to make a promise about how they're going to behave and they have to deliver on it because values inconsistencies today quickly blow up. Okay. Right? Uh, then they have to commit to obsessively aligning into those big, big ideas, those big purpose statements that they're promising and rewire themselves to, to consistently deliver. Mm -hmm. Then look at what norms in the system what norms in their industry are fundamentally working against those big promises, fundamentally working against um, a shared set of values and get after them, change them, just like Tesla's done, just like Tony Chocolonely's in many ways in the chocolate yeah. industry has done. Um, and then be bold, be willing to stand up for the consumers and employees that you believe in. So just to end quickly with Dahlia as an example, if the end story um, at the end of the day had been Kellogg's stood up for Dahlia in the first place, they wouldn't be in a position where really the story for the world right now is that Dahlia stood up against big company and won. And we can flip that. And that's what we hear. And then we think that inspired companies can do that. Well, I love it. I, I'm taking note of everything that you say and I'm going to read this book. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> Thank for being you, here. Thank uh, For everything that you do. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.